Everybody know what that is? All right. Some people are knock need. Does everybody know what that is? All right. Well, <laughs> Brother Tony's ducking into here. So last night, we're, we're sitting there watching TV, and a commercial comes on. I don't even remember what it was for, but the, the lady that was doing the speaking in the, was knock-kneed. And, I mean, dramatically knock-kneed. It was, it was impressive, really. Uh, but anyhow, uh, Brooklyn is sitting there on the couch, and she goes, Oh, look, that lady's ox-legged. I don't know what ox-legged means. I've heard of people with crow's feet. I've heard of people who are pigeon-toed. But I have never heard of anybody who are, who's ox-legged. And so if anybody figures that out, uh, let me know, because I, I, I like that. That was great. And uh, anyway, thanks for letting me share that, Brooklyn. That, was, that made my night last night. Grab your Bible, and let's all stand and turn to 2 Corinthians. I almost said hymn number. Hymn number 2 Corinthians, chapter 6. 2 Corinthians, chapter 6. And we'll begin reading in verse number 14. 2 Corinthians, chapter 6, verse number 14. The Apostle Paul writes this, Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. I'm going to preach on this tonight. Are you really separate? Are you really separate? Let's pray. We'll have a song and then we'll get into the message. My Father, I do pray now that as we come to the most important time of the service, the preaching of your word, I pray that you would uh, get a hold of our attention, help us to be alert and awake tonight. God, I pray that you would help us to uh, have uh, some spiritual energy about us, mentally, physically, so that we can get what you have for us. God, I pray that you would please empty me of myself tonight and uh, help me to get out of the way. I don't want to hinder you, Lord. I just want you to... Uh, be able to work and be able to say what you have to say. Lord, thank you for giving us the Word of God. And so I pray that you'd fill me with your Spirit. Use me tonight, God. I pray that you'd speak to all of us. And Lord, uh, challenge us with this thought, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for standing. Looking back and thinking I can see where God has led The mountain tops of victory The tears that have been shed And even though I failed Him In so many different ways It almost seems I've heard the voice of Jesus gently on your road let go of your pride he's still by your side and he's always enough sometimes we think we're all alone and no one We do our best to hide the pain and face it on our own.
Frank. I'm glad that he's always enough. He's everything that we need. Amen. Are you really separate? If I were to ask you tonight, what makes you separated as a Christian? Well, let, let's start with this. What is the definition there of the word separate? If you look down at uh, verse number 17, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. What is the definition of that word? It simply means this, to be set off by boundaries. All right, if we, if we said it this way, the platform is separate from the rest of the auditorium. There are some boundaries here. There's some walls. And this is, so this area is separate, uh, so to speak, from the rest of the room. Uh, it means to divide. It means to be excluded. Uh, it means different, but it's, it's deeper than just being different. And so if I were to ask you what makes you as a Christian, don't answer anything tonight, but if I were to ask you this, what makes you separate what would be your answer? I was thinking about that this week, and uh, you know, of course, I've heard this passage preached multiple times in my life, and um, I'm not taking anything away from anybody that preached this passage, but most of the time, I, I, here's what I think. Most of the time, and this is my personal opinion, if we were to ask each other that question, we would probably say we're separate or we're, we're divided from the world because of maybe the music that we listen to. Or the way we speak, the language that we use, the way that we dress, uh, the places that we go or don't go, the people that we hang around or don't hang around. And I believe that's all part of separation. Uh, but I don't think that's what the Apostle Paul is really getting at tonight. I don't think he's, uh, this, I don't think this passage is talking about, I guess, kind of those surface separations. We would call them standards, and I'm all for standards. I believe in standards 100%. I have standards. There's things that I do. There's things that I don't do based on standards and convictions that I have from the Word of God. There's people that I don't hang around, some of them in this room. Just kidding. <laughs> but there are people that I don't. I still get calls from uh, coworkers when I worked at Home Depot for seven years. And I haven't worked there now for about two years. I still get every now and then text messages and phone calls from some of them. They're like, hey, uh, specifically one, an older gentleman. He plays the guitar. And uh, he's constantly doing, he's like 65. And he's always playing gigs. <laughs> he still has a garage band. And he, he's always inviting me. Hey, I'm going to be playing here tonight. I'm going to be playing here this weekend. You should come out. I'm like, hey, okay. No. <laughs> I know I'm not rude to him, but I, he's, he's not saved. I like the guy. We had a great time as, uh, when we worked together, but I'm not going to go hang out with him because we're not the same. He doesn't believe like I believe. He doesn't think like I think. And, and while I can be friendly to him, he's not going to be my best friend. And so uh, we can look at that and say, yes, there are, there are things that separate me. And, and, and it could be uh, things like that dress and uh, movies and entertainment and all kinds of stuff that we could list out. But I think that Paul is talking about a deeper kind of difference here. A, a bigger, broader, deeper kind of separation. Look back up at chapter 5. We're going to kind of just work our way down through this a little bit tonight. And I really just, I have a, just a thought. I don't have an outline or anything like that. But I want you to just follow me tonight. Look at chapter 5, verse number 17. Familiar verse. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. All right? New creatures. Old things are passed away. What would that mean? Would it, would it mean old music? goes away? Sure. Could it mean old ways of dressing goes away? Sure. Could it mean old friends uh, disappear, old relationships end? Sure. Could it mean old things that I used to say, old things that I used to do? Yes, it means it entails all of that. But I want you to look now down at verse number 20. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. The word ambassador means a representative. As a Christian, I represent someone. I'm not just saved. I'm not just on my way to heaven and I'm not going to hell. I represent someone. By using the name or the term, I am a Christian, I represent somebody. 
And if I were to say that out in the world today, many people would know right away, okay, they may not know all the ins and outs of Christianity, but if I walked out here tonight and said, I'm a Christian, people would know, okay, that guy lines up with Jesus Christ. Whatever that might mean to, in their mind, they would understand he is saying, I line up with Jesus Christ. If I were to say I'm a Republican or I'm a Democrat or my, I'm a moderate or I'm a liberal or I'm left and I'm right and I'm whatever, there's all kinds of labels that we could use and people would understand there's something that goes with that term. There's something that goes with that label. And so for me to stand and say that I am a Christian, I'm representing who? Christ. All right, that, that's logic. I mean, that's, that's not a hard question. I represent the Lord Jesus Christ. My dad used to tell me when we were kids, I'd go on ball trips uh, when I was in high school, and he'd say, listen, you represent God first, but your last name is Coyle. You represent me. You represent our family. If you go out and do something stupid, it makes all of us look bad. And so I represent, I was an ambassador, so to speak, of the Coyle family. And so new thing, we're, we're new creatures, old things are passed away. Why? Because we're saved, because as a Christian I am an ambassador. I represent the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse number 21, chapter 5. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Christ didn't just carry my sin. He became my sin. He didn't just pick it up like a suitcase or a moving box and take it with him to the cross. He became my sin and your sin. And so when we think about what he did just in that sense alone, then think about, man, I, I represent him everywhere I go. It's bigger than just my hairdo or the way I dress, or the things that I say. I'm representing the God of the universe. Now look at chapter 6, verse number 1. We then, as workers, so we're new creatures, then we're ambassadors. Now he says, we then as workers together with who? Him. Who is him? God. We're workers together with the Lord. Beseech you also that ye receive not the grace of God in vain. We don't abuse the grace of God. God gave us grace and mercy when he saved us. He gave us what we did not deserve in that we are going to heaven one day and God daily loadeth us with benefits. Those are things that we don't deserve, yet God gives them to us. And we also did not get what we do deserve. We do deserve to spend eternity in hell, but thank God we're not going there. I don't have to go to hell tonight. I told a guy one time at work, uh, he got mad about something, and he told me to go there, and I said, I can't. Sorry. I could go home. I could go to another part of the store, but I can't go there. You say, that was sarcastic. You're right, it was, and I felt good about it. It probably wasn't the right thing to say, but... Made me feel good on the inside. Vain. He said that we receive not the grace of God in vain. Now, the word vain means empty, and it means fruitless. So here, here's what he's saying there. For us to live our lives like the old creature, that's abusing the grace of God. That's, the grace of God is vain if there's not something separate about me. We're working our way down there, okay? Was everybody tracking? We, we are abusing God's grace. It, it's the, those people who say, well, I'm saved. I can do whatever I want. No. Because of what he did for me in chapter 5, verse number 21, he became my sin. I don't want to just do whatever the flesh wants. Now, from time to time, I do still sin. No, not from time to time. I sin a whole bunch. Let's just keep it real. And you do too. All right? We sin an awful lot, but I, I don't just get up in the morning and think I'm going to do what the flesh wants today because I'm saved and God's grace will just okay it. God will just forgive me and we'll move on. No, 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 no. That makes it vain. That's, that's empty. That makes the grace of God empty. Now, fruitful. I was thinking about this because of that, that, that word, meaning it means fruitless. 
What does God want from my life? He wants me to bear fruit. We're coming back to 2 Corinthians. Go to John chapter 15. John chapter 15. John chapter 15. Look at verse number 5. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. Drop down to verse number 8. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit. So, ye, so shall ye be my disciples. Verse 16. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you, that ye should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain. That whatsoever you should you shall ask of my Father in my name, He may give it you. So God wants us to be fruitful. All right. So we got saved. Now we're a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. We now are ambassadors. We're representatives for the Lord Jesus Christ. We are workers with Him. God has a plan. God has uh, something that He is trying to accomplish in this world, and I get to be a part of that. What a thought. God could have used a whole lot of other people. God could have used a whole lot of other things. I mean, uh, think about humanity. We're the one part of God's creation that doesn't do what we were made to do. I mean, a dog wakes up and is a dog. And a cat in the trees and, and the sun rises in the east and sets in the west every day. And, uh, and so every part of creation, every other part of creation does exactly what God created it to do, but we have free will. And so we get to choose to follow God's plan for our life or not follow God's plan for our life. And so for God to pick us to be a part of his plan is a pretty big deal. I mean, God's really saying, uh, God did the hard part. He gave his only begotten son, and Jesus died on the cross, and now they've left it up, essentially they've left it up to us. If we don't tell people, people won't get saved. God is, it's almost like God has limited himself to us. Now, I don't want to let God down. And I don't think anybody, I don't think any Christian in their right mind says, well, I want to let God down. No, none of us do. We just, we're sinners. We fail. But I think our, uh, I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. I think we want to do right. We want to bear fruit. All right, so let's go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Fruit we saw it in John chapter 5. Fruit comes from our relationship with the Lord. He says, abide in me. Let my word abide in you. If you abide in me and I in you, uh, you'll bear much fruit. And so it comes from that relationship with God. I cannot be fruitful apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? Now, look at chapter 6 and verse number 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse number 3. So we started in verse 17. We're talking about being separate. Look at verse number three, giving no offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed. The word offense there means stumbling or to lead into error. It means to give an occasion of sin. It means to cause someone else to stumble, to cause someone else to fall, to cause someone else to uh, stumble off into sin. Offense. We are ambassadors. We are new creatures. We are representatives. We are workers with Christ. And we are not to give offense. We're not to cause offense. What's the end of the verse say? That what be not blamed? The ministry be not blamed. Not, not necessarily just Liberty Baptist Church, but God's ministry. God's ministry of reconciliation in the end of chapter 5. That ministry. And so when, when he says in verse 17 that we're to, be, we're to come out from among them and be ye separate, say it the Lord, this is why. We're to be separate, we're to be different so that we don't give offense and we don't cause God's ministry of reconciliation to be blamed or to be falsely accused. Now, the world doesn't like us. The world doesn't like Christianity. The world does not like Jesus Christ. And they're going to say whatever they want to say. 
But God help me and God help you if they, if they falsely accuse God or they come up with some uh, terrible thing to say about our God because of me. And so, while I believe, uh, again, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying we shouldn't have personal standards. I'm not saying that we shouldn't have a difference in the way that we talk and walk and dress and think and sing and, and all of that. I, I think that stuff should be different. But let's keep reading now in verse number 4. He says in verse 3, Giving no offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed, colon. That means it's not the end of the sentence. Verse 4, he says, But in all things, what does all mean? All. You guys are smart. But in all things, approving ourselves as the ministers of God. Stop right there. The word approving means to exhibit or to present means to show. So we're to be, uh, in all things, we're to show or exhibit ourselves as the ministers of God. Now let's start looking at some of these things that he lists. In much patience. Is the world that we live in today, are they patient? No. So for us to be separate would mean that I have to be patient. They're not. They should see a difference in me in the fact that I am patient. Now, don't raise your hand, but how many of you are good at patience? JR, you're a greater man than I. <laughs> In patience, let's keep going. In afflictions, how, how well do you handle affliction? Think about, think about your coworkers, think about your neighbors, think about lost people that you come into contact with. How do they handle affliction? And then think about you as a Christian. How do you handle affliction? You see, I could, I could dress up in a suit and tie and lose my temper just as quickly as a lost person can. So I don't believe that Paul is just saying if we dress right and we, and we talk right and we listen to the right kind of music, then, then we've got it all figured out. We are separate. No, I think that's part of it, I, but I think that's just kind of surface. How are we doing in patience? How do we handle affliction? Let's keep reading. In necessities, in distresses, in stripes. Thank God we haven't got to the place in America yet where we're being imprisoned and beaten. In tumults, in labors, in watchings, in fastings. By pureness, by knowledge, by long-suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love unfeigned. Listen, we could spend an entire message probably on each one of these things individually. Verse 7, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left, by honor. Listen, remember what he's talking about. In all things, we're approving or we're, we're manifesting, we're showing that we are ministers of God. We are good representatives of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse number eight, in honor and in dishonor. When people are good to us and pat us on the back for being a good godly Christian and when somebody else says you're a stinking idiot and you're a scumbag for believing in Jesus, we show ourselves a minister of God. Or, well, you're an, you're an idiot. Your mom. Where's Kesley? <laughs> she was telling that story that it's been a while a while back. She said the first she got over there, somebody at, at school, somebody said something sarcastic to her one day. She walked into class and somebody said something sarcastic. The first thing in my mouth was your mom. <laughs> and she said, and then I thought, Well, that wasn't very Christian. You know, even in jest, even in joking, uh, should we should we go that far? I don't know. You say something about my mom and I'm probably gonna forget that I'm a Christian. Right? We all have those, those things. You say, well, I, I can handle that kind of stuff. Everybody's got at least one button. At least one. If you're normal, you've got multiple. And everybody's got that one person in their life, at least one, that can find that one button. And they like to come to work and go, how you handle that, Mr. Christian? How do you handle it? Are you separate? Are you different from the world? Listen, to what he's, this is what he's saying. Look at verse number eight, honor and dishonor. By evil report and good report. 
Are we, are we good? Are we showing ourselves, approving ourselves as ministers of God in evil report and good report? As deceivers, they, tell, they say you're deceivers, but yet we're true. As unknown and yet well-known, by dying and behold we live as chastened and not killed, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. As sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. God has worked me over the last several months about uh, this idea of, of having a joyful spirit. Uh, I was going to I was going to tell you after the service. I'll just say it publicly. Brother Chadwick is an encourager. I, I don't know him that well. Uh, I met him the first time at Pot of Gold. Worst team camp in America. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I got a witness on that. I met no AC. Uh, it was like two miles to the top of the hill for chapel, and we had chapel like 900 times a day. And in the middle of June and July when we went to camp, it was 700 degrees. And it was just, and I'm not exaggerating that a bit. But we met down there, and uh, and then through the years, we've we've he, he know, pastor knows him much much better than I do. But from what I have seen of Brother Chadwick, he's an encourager, and I appreciate that. And I see people like that, and that's what I I, I aspire to be. I want to be an encourager. But I find myself so often not. I'm too concerned about, man, my coffee was terrible this morning. <laughs> hey, how you doing? I don't, I don't really care how you're doing. I, I had an awful cup of coffee. You know, and that's silly and that's simple. And, but how often do the simple things just wreck your whole day? And then somebody comes across your path that needs encouragement. God put them in your path so that you could encourage them. And you're just wrecked because there's no hot water. Ox legged. The ox took all the hot water. <laughs> anyway, let me move on. As sorrowful yet always rejoicing. That's what I was saying. Man, I, I want to have a joyful spirit. It doesn't matter what's going on. I have the Lord Jesus Christ. I have reason to have joy. If it all fell apart tomorrow, there's still reason for joy. Because of the Lord Jesus Christ in my life. If, if the only thing I can think of is I'm not going through it alone, that's reason for joy. And so how do we, how do we handle it? Remember verse number four, in all things, all things, good or bad, sorrow or joy, evil report, good, it doesn't matter. In all things, approving ourselves, Showing ourselves, presenting ourselves as the ministers of God in all of these things. As poor, verse 10, yet making many rich. Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. That's what they said to that guy begging. As poor, man, I ain't got a lot of money. We took the offering in Super Church today and, and four or five kids, they turn around and look right at me. Hey, can I have a dollar? I ain't got a dollar. I told one kid, he was like four rows away. He goes, can I have some money? I said, I'm But you know what? I can give them something better than money. We can give them Jesus. We gave some Bibles away today. We, we told them about the Lord. We told them they need to be strong in the Lord. And uh, we're giving them some. They may not understand it, but we're giving them something greater than silver and gold. We may be poor in the world's eyes, but we're making people rich because of the Lord Jesus Christ. And our lives are so full and so rich because of the Lord Jesus Christ as having nothing and yet possessing all things. It may not look like I've got a lot down here, but my father owns the cattle on a thousand hills, the wealth in every mine, and I am joint heir with the only begotten. That means I get what he gets. So if it all belongs to my father, technically, it all belongs to me. The world looks at us and they... They think, man, you've got nothing and your life is a waste. You're serving it. You're spending your life serving some God that you've never seen and some God that doesn't talk to you and they just don't know. And I, my favorite verse to share with people is, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. 
I, I could try to explain it to you. I could show you verses. But the best thing I can tell you is just try it. Did you go to the terminal at all this week while you were here? Reading Terminal. Did you get a Reuben? Okay. Pastrami Reuben. I was about to be heartbroken for you if you didn't get one of those. That's my favorite sandwich in the whole city. Hands down. I like Steve's Prince of Steaks. I like the Denix Roast Pork. I like fried chicken tacos from Hefe. Amen. Those are pretty good if you've never had those. But that pastrami Reuben. Oh, taste and see. That, that man is good. <laughs> Whatever that guy's doing to that pastrami, it is wonderful. And you can tell me, Carlos sitting here tonight, you can tell me Arby's has a pretty good Reuben. And I will politely tell you, you're out of your mind. Poor little dumb thing. That's what they would say in the South, right? Bless your heart. That means you're stupid. Bless their little heart, Lord. They don't know a thing. Oh, taste and see. Hey, I may not be able to explain everything about this Bible, but I know the things God has done in my life. And you may, you just got to try it. You've just got to try it. You need to experience God. Whether I'm talking to Christians or lost people, at some point I always try to fit that in, man. Try God. Just try Him. Give Him a shot. You've tried all kinds of religion. You've tried all kinds of other things. Try God. He'll never let you down. So he goes through this list of things. These things are what should separate us. We get all the way through there, and then he gets into verse number 14. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And then he, he gives some differences, some comparisons here. Uh, what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? Communion. Uh, what communion hath light with darkness? What concord hath Christ with Belial? He lists all these things. And then says in verse 17, Wherefore, wherefore, because of all of this, because of everything that we've just looked at and I've just said, the Apostle Paul, wherefore, come out from among them. Come out from among them and be ye separate. How are we to be separate in those things? How does the world respond in those same kinds of situations? When things are good, life is great. I don't need God. When things are bad, where is God? And I can dress myself up, but if I respond and I live the same way they live, it doesn't matter that I come to church three times a week. And it doesn't matter that I wear a suit and tie. And it doesn't matter that I listen to Christian music. And it doesn't matter that I'm conservative and that I have standards and that I have convictions. And I think you should. And I think it's biblical. But that comes, I believe, after this. Because the closer I get to God, the more I abide in Him and He and His Word abides in me, I begin to bear fruit. And nowhere in the Bible where it talks about fruit do I find it say anything about my music, my words, my dress. I think all of that is, I think it all comes. God does change those things. But the Bible says, work out your salvation. God saved me on the inside. I think sometimes we think if I change everything on the outside and I make it look good. And listen, I've been, in, I've been in this my whole life. And Baptists have been good at this. We tell people, it's almost like we expect them, if you change the outside, then you're a good Christian, whether the inside has changed or not. But that is not what the Bible teaches. You get God, the inside changes, the outside will follow. That's the norm. That's the way that it works. I wonder if the reason so many people have gotten out of church and so many people quit on God is because they've been taught or told or forced. And I'm not, I'm not being negative about anybody. But you have to dress a certain way. I believe in dressing a certain way. But if my heart isn't in it, this is just changing my behavior for a little bit. God wants my heart. If he's got my heart, he'll have everything else. These are the things that make us different. Go to Matthew chapter 5. 
We're about done. Matthew chapter 5. This is our theme verse for the youth department. Matthew chapter 5, verse number 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify who? Your Father. No one is supposed to be able to look at me and my good works and go, man, what a great Christian. They should look at me and my good works and go, he's got a real God. There's something different about his religion. There's something different about him. Whatever he has is legit. There's people all around the world that look at religious people and go, phony. Phony. I've been in that. I've tried that. I've done that. I've seen what you're like. I've seen where that goes. It's just a bunch of phony baloney. But if they look at a real Christian who's in a real relationship with God, they'll see something that's different. And good works here does not mean the way that I talk, the way that I dress. Again, don't misunderstand me. I'm all for all of that. But that's not the point. The point is getting in with the Lord. It says that they may see your good works. Well, what good works would it be talking about? Well, let's look at verse number 1. And seeing the multitudes, he went into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Let me, let me ask you, do the, people, the lost people in your life, would you classify them as meek, poor in spirit, humble? It's not the world we live in. So what makes us different? Am I meek? Am I humble? Am I poor in spirit? Because if I'm not, then how am I separate? I mean, honestly... I, I like to wear blue jeans and, and hoodies and sweatshirts and, and Nike tennis shoes. And I've seen dope dealers out here, on the, out here on the corner with the same Eagles hoodie that I have. I go stand out there beside them and we look just the same. So that's not necessarily what we're talking about. Let's keep reading. Verse 6. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. How many people in the world do you know that are that? Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake for theirs is the kingdom of heaven blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you rejoice and be exceeding glad when you get persecuted do you get persecuted on the job as a Christian and if you do can the lost people look at you and go, I mean, he's, how does he have such a great spirit? I mean, they're mocking him. They're making fun of him for being a Christian, and he's rejoicing, and he's exceeding glad about it. I mean, if that were the only one in that list, how are we doing? There was a guy I worked with at Home Depot. His name was Joe. His goal, he worked there for about a year and a half. His goal, he told me multiple times, I'm going to make you cuss before one of us quits. I was like, okay, won't happen. But if, I mean, if that's what you're living for, <laughs> what's that life? <laughs> you got to come to work just to try to make the Christian cuss. I'm sorry to disappoint you. You know what? I never cussed. Does that make me a great Christian? 
I did call Joe an idiot multiple times. I told Joe he was going to burn in hell one day. So just because I didn't cuss makes me a separated Christian. Really, on those days, I wasn't any better than he was. Wasn't any different than he was. I'm just saying. How are we doing on these things? And again, this whole passage, we could preach a message on all of them. I didn't even stop to define any of these things. Are we, how are we doing? Are you really separated? Are you really separate? We're supposed to look like Christ. I don't think Jesus wore a suit and tie. Now, I'm going to keep wearing a suit and tie to church. That's just what I'm going to do. But Jesus was kind and merciful. Jesus was patient. Jesus was meek. Yeah, there were a few times when he, when he put them in their place. I liked it when he went in and flipped over the tables. Yes, that's what I'm talking about. But he only did that once. Are we really separate? You see, I'm afraid sometimes I'll say I, because I have. I look at me and think I'm a separated Christian because I have all these outward things in order. But if I'm not different on the inside, this is worthless. Can the people out there look at the people in here? Because they're honestly, they're not looking at my clothes. We've had dozens of them through the years walk in those doors, and they're looking for religion that is real. That is real. So could anybody walk in here tonight and look at you and go, that's the real deal. Their God is what I want. I read a story, Brooklyn Tabernacle. The, I don't even remember what the guy's name was, the pastor of that, that church up there. He ended the service one night and he was sitting down on the edge of the platform and he said, I saw a homeless man. Obviously, you know, he said he walked in and he started walking down uh, just filthy, nasty, dirty. He said, before he even got to me, I could smell him. He said, I knew what it, you know, I, they're in New York. And he said, I knew what he wanted. And so he said, I leaned over and I reached in my pocket. He said, and he came up to me and he said, no, I don't want that. He said, I want what that lady that was singing in the choir tonight when she gave her testimony I want what she's got. There was something different about her. He said, and the Lord smote my heart. You know, here I am. I, he said, I, I assumed about this guy. And God said to me, that's what you looked like when you came to me. Could anybody out there walk in tonight and see real Christianity? Or would they just see a bunch of people that look like they've got it together, but we're really not any different on here, on the inside. Are we really separate? Heads bowed, eyes closed. <clears throat> Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Are you really separate? 